Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Morano. On this program, we learn more about the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies program at New Mexico State University. This program aims to help provide more understanding in how race, class, gender, and sexuality shape our lived experiences. Our guest today has worked years to make this program a reality at NMSU. Please welcome Dr. Dulcinea Lara, Director and Professor of the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now I'd like to start off, uh, you have extensive research and background in ethnic studies. Why did you decide to pursue this field? Great question. Um, I'm from these borderlands, I'm from this area, and um, when I went to college all the way in Michigan, I uh, was exposed to ethnic studies courses as an undergraduate student where I started to learn about the shape of the world in relationship to race, in rela relationship to gender. And so those classes that I was able to take in my undergraduate experience were really um, illuminating and really insightful in terms of the kinds of experiences I had as a young person here uh, growing up in the borderlands. Um, things that I wasn't aware of in my K through 12 education that really explained how a society is structured in a way that offers um, wide open doors for some groups and smaller opportunities for, for other groups. And so from that point on, having taken my first ethnic studies class, I just continued on and went to go get my PhD in ethnic studies. What was your inspiration uh, behind establishing this program at New Mexico State University? What do you think this program can really bring to our community? That's a great question. I, in my journey of studying ethnic studies, I feel like a stronger understanding of how society works to um, offer opportunities or offer disadvantages historically and contemporarily can really boost a person's um, ambition to sort of work within and to change a system that's designed in these, these ways to um, operate in ways that segregate, in ways that um, preclude opportunities from, from some groups. And so I was destined to bring ethnic studies to NMSU along with a lot of people before me um, because of the impact that that kind of knowledge, that kind of education can have on economic outcomes for people, on social outcomes, on um, political representation and voice. And so uh, ever since I came to NMSU in 2007, I started learning about all these different moments when faculty and students and community were encouraging NMSU to start classes in Chicano studies, Native American studies since the 1960s. And so I just picked up those files, I picked up those papers and started working with people who were similarly interested in expanding um, the horizons of course offerings that are culturally relevant, um, linguistically relevant, that um, touch people's realities who live in the borderlands, um, these racialized, marginalized communities that are often seen as tangential or as courses that are simply electives. And so I, I knew from the research that these kinds of classes have a major impact on students' um, life outcomes. Let's talk a little bit about how it could impact students. What can prospective students expect to gain from their experience in this program? Sure, so we're a brand new department, we're growing. Um, we are seeing from other K through 12 systems and from other universities and colleges, particularly in California where ethnic studies is um, being normalized, that everything increases in a student's proficiency who take ethnic studies courses from increased graduation rates, increased um, GPA, 
um, increased attendance levels. So there's just this more intrinsic connection with their entire educational experience. And we've seen the data for um, high school graduation rates as well as for college graduation rates. And so NMSU really stands to benefit from ethnic studies classes um, because of our population being so largely um, racialized minority groups. I think we're over 65% um, racialized minorities at NMSU. And so those graduation rates stand to increase and um, ethnic studies is interdisciplinary. So we get students from agriculture, education, business, um, all the humanities, all the social sciences who are interested in making an impact in communities. So public health and social work, for example, I get students from those areas who not only want to exercise their subject area, but want to know how do I truly engage with um, people in a way that is both effective and sustainable. And that's what we do in ethnic studies. Um, talk about those historical moments when different groups were separated and how we can kind of mend those relationships, mend those, um, those fissures that have happened over time. Now, ethnic studies has been in the news quite a bit in recent years. Uh, in election year, of course, it's a, it can be a hot button word. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear national politicos using it quite a bit, but this is a field that's been around for decades. Can you kind of give us an understanding of the history behind ethnic studies and really how it came to be to what we know it today? Sure, so ethnic studies really was kind of born as a discipline in the Bay Area, California, and it comes from uh, connections with uh, labor movements, um, particularly the farm workers movement, um, children of uh, veterans of World War II, um, coming out to say, why is there still segregation if my parents sacrificed in the war, for example, or if they um, are part of the backbone of the United States. And so the, that, those 1960s kind of social upheavals, those movements led to a call for more accurate education. Essentially, that's how I describe ethnic studies as a more accurate, a more complete education. And so because of those um, protests and struggles in the 1960s, the late 1960s, you have the birth of what is called ethnic studies in 1969 at San Francisco State University. Um, and then, of course, um, Berkeley followed and other universities in California, and then it spread across the United States. Um, I have documentation of students and staff and faculty at NMSU calling for ethnic studies in 1970, so wow. right at that same moment. That's really uh, interesting, the history behind it, and just students also taking part in the effort to really establish ethnic studies uh, dealing with this history. But I, I want to ask you now, borderlands is included, uh, the study of the borderlands as well. So how do you implement that into this program and why is that so important to understand the history of our region and how it is affecting us even to this day. Absolutely, so I was educated in California um, and I learned all the history of ethnic studies in California, this kind of um, urban uh, movement, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, um, and that rich tradition. And I'm from uh, uh, Berino, I'm from New Mexico, Southern New Mexico, and so my experience was rural and my experience was sort of being in these borderlands but having this kind of distance from, from Mexico, right? We didn't learn about Mexico, we didn't learn Mexican history. Um, children at my, in my school district were kind of um, steered away from speaking Spanish, sort of steered away from anything culturally um, vibrant in them. And so the borderlands aspect is kind of to think about um, this, this crossroads of two nations um, coming together and what that vibrant culture looks like in the borderlands, but also how uh, segregated those uh, uh, the United States is from Mexico and this kind of narrative of that side and this side, um, Spanish and English, right? And so the borderlands part of our, our department, our program, um, distinguishes us from other ethnic studies programs across the United States and also can amplify the, the study of the borderlands in a unique way. Um, linguistically, culturally, politically, and I should say that we're, we're thinking about borderlands in the most expansive way. So also thinking of border towns where um, Native American reservations and nations um, abut other communities that are not part of um, the indigenous uh, culture, 
where uh, we have, um, you know, thinking about critical Arab studies, like uh, the, the Palestine-Israel border. What does that look like in comparison to um, El Paso Juarez, for example? And so thinking about how borders themselves impact a person's identity, but also collective identities. And part of borderland studies is to think about the celebrations that can be possible when, um, when we sort of traverse borders, go back and forth, and also kind of disregard them or, or reinvent what it means to be in the borderlands. So we have um, um, that going on with the uniqueness that, we, that we're offering those classes in that way here at NMSU. You mentioned uh, about growing up in, in Michigan and seeing what was available there with schools and the communities there, uh, perhaps certain advantages, uh, quality of life, quality of education. Uh, was having ethnic studies uh, available in those areas surprising when you got there, knowing that you didn't have that available here while you're a student? Sure, so actually I did um, study in eighth grade in Michigan when my father was out there on a post doctorate. Um, and yes, there were, it was much more international. And so I was in classes with students from all over the world when I was in eighth grade. And that's what prompted me to go back as an undergrad in college. But it was totally shocking to be learning about New Mexico history and um, the politics of immigration and the politics of race influenced by, by immigration, by national boundaries. Um, having grown up in a place where lots of um, people like to study. People come from other universities to study these borderlands. And so we're super excited to start the study of borderlands and ethnic studies here um, to have that knowledge production, that knowledge generation come from these communities themselves and become sort of the official narrative instead of kind of, you know, these things that happen in the home or these things that happen privately, this is the narrative of the borderlands and we want to amplify that knowledge that has been um, intentionally and maybe unintentionally left out. Now, Searchlight New Mexico interviewed you uh, this year to highlight the work you're doing. Um, and one of the quotes that you mentioned to them was uh, dealing with education and the systems and curriculum and around it and how it impacts students of color, people of color. You said, quote, for the longest time, the education curriculum was meant to assimilate all students and all people to one standard. And that standard was a more European and Anglo way of thinking and being education so far hasn't been culturally relevant to the majority of people of color, end quote. Can you give me an example of this statement happening today? Yes, um, so obviously we kind of know historically now about boarding schools and about sort of corporal punishment for speaking anything besides English in schools. Um, we still have the struggle going on, even though there are um, willing educators and willing principals and superintendents across New Mexico, let's say for example, the materials in the classroom are uh, very much outdated, very much um, uh, incomplete, I would call it, um, still sort of rely heavily on uh, a dominant narrative that privileges uh, men, that privileges um, Anglo people. Um, I believe that it's, it's kind of a scavenger hunt to find um, prominent women even mentioned in the history materials for K-12. Um, and so this continues to, to happen. And so part of what I learned from working with educators is we need new materials. We have the excitement, the enthusiasm is there. And now the social studies standards have changed. However, what do, where are the books? Where are the materials? Um, and so while it's not as overt as boarding schools, as corporal punishment for speaking Spanish, it's a more covert way of continuing this trend of an assimilationist education where any Thing cultural is an elective or it's an after-school program but it's not part of the official uh, teachings the official narrative in in the schools broadly based okay now you've worked with the state Department of Education and teachers in southern New Mexico to learn more about the struggles that the teachers are facing in our region can you kind of share with us what were some of your findings after speaking with these teachers and learning more about the challenges they face the teachers are working incredibly um, hard. They're so dedicated. We worked with a group of 15 
um, Southern New Mexico educators, history and social studies educators. And one thing is that history is not seen as, um, as, as, as important as STEM, for example. Um, and so social studies is kind of seen as uh, tangential. It's not kind of the core. And so I think to amplify the importance of history, to really dig into history and see it as very important to everything we do, uh, that's something that really struck me. And even at the college level in New Mexico, I think the history requirements have been cut back. So you don't need as much history to graduate. And I feel like that's a cornerstone of understanding our relationships as human beings. And so that was one thing that we learned. And the other was just, as I mentioned, we need more materials. We need the materials that tell the, the stories that have been uh, left out in favor of kind of maintaining control and maintaining kind of this economic and politi po political segregation. Now, New Mexico is facing a big challenge uh, to meet these goals with the new standards uh, that are being implemented. Uh, also trying to address the Yazi Martinez lawsuit that the state faces, the consolidated lawsuit uh, that found that the state of New Mexico was not providing an adequate education for all students, especially low income, Native American, English language learners and students with disabilities. How do you feel the work that you're doing right now uh, with this program and communicating with teachers and educators in our region can address the issues that are stated in the lawsuit? The, the issues are very deep, uh, but they're not intractable. Um, I teach ideology from day one in my classes. And so um, there is this deficit perspective kind of built into our psyches about who is considered intelligent, who is considered less intelligent, who is capable, who's less capable, um, who is considered trustworthy, less trustworthy. And so these ideas have been ingrained for centuries. Um, and so I think teaching about where does that idea come from, right? So, so you've probably heard about um, anti-bias training and kind of this um, individualistic look at where did my biases come from? But what we do in ethnic studies is a systematic analysis of Let's look at history and when that moment happened where Native people were portrayed in this way as savage, as uncivilized, when Mexican people were um, portrayed in the way of less than Americans, right, or just workers, or where women were considered less intelligent than men. Like there are actual moments, um, events, policies that are rooted in colonization. And so if you don't kind of go back, then we just have this kind of anti-bias training where everyone kind of walks away feeling um, a little bad or a little bit more informed, but we need to look at the roots. And so by looking at the roots of where those ideas percolated, where they came from, then we can start to interrupt them and say, well, wait a minute, you know, why is the composition of this boardroom so male? Why is the composition of this classroom so white? Why is the composition of this um, meeting um, not including youthful voices, right? Um, why do we privilege certain people as capable, intelligent, and worthy, and others not so much? And so it's this kind of deficit mindset to where, like I mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily intentionally we're going to um, disservice English language learners and um, students with special needs and Native American students and students with low income, which is what Yazi Martinez addresses, um, but it's kind of built in that they're not as capable anyway, so we're not necessarily going to put as much effort into those populations. And so what the Martinez Yazi Yazi Martinez ruling says is no more of that. We have to do something special, sort of an affirmative action. We are going to affirm that historically these populations have been um, disregarded, and now we're going to have to do something special to affirm their equal value in New Mexico. And so it's pretty incredible that that legal ruling really is putting into motion that resources need to be allocated, um, teachers need to be supported. Um, we are being supported to create those materials, those new lessons, those new films that um, re-earth and unearth these kind of silenced histories. They're not forgotten histories. They've been silenced intentionally to maintain this kind of um, racial segregation over time. I got a viewer email about this program and the establishment of it and how it can make a difference. This viewer said in the email, quote, this is a small opportunity for ethnic students to learn something about their history in this state and the country 
something lacking in the public schools where we are invisible, end mm. quote. When you hear something like that, I mean, what are your thoughts? Um, this work is very emotional. Um, I hear that person saying, I would have liked that in my own education, right? Um, I would have liked to uh, have that opportunity to take those classes. And so at the same time that this is a very serious intellectual project, this has uh, deep um, psychological and emotional uh, repercussions. So students who are seeing themselves for the first time in Chicana literature with uh, Gloria Ansaldúa or Ana Castillo, Denise Chavez, um, I remember being that undergraduate in that class, uh, and it can move you to tears, where you think, oh my gosh, my people are writers, they're thinkers, they're published, they're scientists, they are um, engineers, right? My people are capable of these things, and the truth is that they always were. Those opportunities were just not afforded. So while ethnic studies is about history and culture, it's really about how do we um, restructure society in a way where everyone is amplified and we are healthier because of that. So, um, so while people might think it's cultural studies only, it's really branching out into kind of every facet, every college, if you will. Um, and in the K through 12 system with these required classes, the idea there is, to, is that people can stay in their communities and make those communities more vibrant, more healthy, more viable economically. All of the, all of the um, areas can have impact. I've interviewed a lot of executives in corporate America over the years as, as a journalist. And I have received feedback from them when they talk about the successes and overcoming challenges. They have mentioned that they understood systems and how they worked and how they could work, how that understanding helped them solve problems that they were facing. This is often celebrated and obviously in corporate America, it's well rewarded. So I, I'm kind of interested to hearing from you. Um, why do you think this, the pursuit of this education gets uh, you know, so much uh, pushback when it's being celebrated, the understanding of systems in, in corporate America as well? I think what ethnic studies does is not only about understanding systems and how to navigate those systems, but how to radically change them. Right? Or I, instead of radically, I say reasonably change those systems so that there are more seats afforded at the table for various people. Um, and so, you know, for example, outside in the private sector, um, multiple languages is a, is a good thing. Um, but here in, in the borderlands, you'll often see even in the school system, speaking Spanish isn't so rewarded. And so I think what we're trying to say is let's try this um, completely inclusive equitable approach to society where everyone has value. And I think we will see a major change. Um, and I think people who have maintained power for so long in this country fear that um, as though they will be replaced. And it's not a, a replacement. It's about um, amplifying and elevating more perspectives so that just like you mentioned, the solution making is not only more effective, it's um, more sustainable. Wonderful. I want to hear from you about uh, efforts that you've been involved with, uh, an upcoming exhibition that deals with social justice and inequalities in the borderlands. Uh, now you have an opening that's happening soon at UTEP. Maybe you can share with us in the few minutes that we have left with you a little bit about this and how you think it could really shine light on some of the issues that we face in the borderland. Yeah, thank you. We're really excited. Um, this is a show that was developed over the years with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Nicholas Natividad and Daniel Aguilera. I want to plug them. Um, the idea was to bring complex, uh, difficult to co uh, talk about concepts like power, like race, like um, segregation, like um, uh, the dehumanization that a lot of people in the borderlands have gone through, both indigenous and Mexican people and women, and create an interactive museum exhibition for all ages that's bilingual, where people can go and in a kind of safer way talk about these ideas. Uh, we have games, um, everything's interactive. We have installations where people can kind of see themselves in mirrors and kind of wonder about their own social location. 
um, and we touch on really um, hard historical topics in our in our borderlands region so we hope everyone can come out it's a, an experience where um, parents and grandparents and kids can kind of learn together in a I wouldn't call it a fun environment, but I would call it intentionally designed for engagement in a way that feels good. Okay, and the title of the exhibition is? Pasos Ajenos, uh, Social Inequalities and Justice in the Borderlands. And where can folks find out more about that? Um, you can go to the Centennial Museum at UTEP to find out more about our show upcoming. Thank you. Okay, opening reception August 13th from 2 to 4 p.m. Yes at the museum and uh, Chihuahua Desert Gardens. Yes. Um, now, as we close, I'd like to hear from you. This has been such an ongoing effort establishing uh, this uh, department at, at New Mexico State University. What are your hopes uh, in the near future of some goals that you can reach to really uh, achieve what, what the mission of this department is? It's a great question. We would really like to start seeing um, more students from more backgrounds taking our classes and really demystifying ethnic studies, critical race theory, um, uh, power, how power operates, and just start to see a more um, sensible reasonable and comfortable conversation about power dynamics so that we kind of uh, replace that fear with uh, information and conversation. Okay, Dr. Dulcinea Lara, I want to thank you so much thank for you. joining us. Thank you, Anthony. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Fronteras, a Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. I want to let you know that we're on social media. You can always like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to the KRWG News YouTube channel, where you can watch past episodes of this program. And remember, you can always send us your thoughts. You can email us at feedback at nmsu.edu, where we always look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again for joining us.